أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 79 he says as for they as for those who ridicule the believers who give freely and those who find nothing to spend except their effort so they ridicule them God will ridicule them and they will have a painful punishment as you recall brothers and sisters many of the verses that we've covered so far were in the context of the Prophet ﷺ recruiting the Muslims to join him for the battle of Tabuk. And as we've mentioned in our previous sessions, there were some, there were some among the hypocrites who refused to join. Others made excuses. Some made some tried to offer religious justifications. Others mentioned logistical issues that we were having that they were having in any case the holy prophet one of the things that he does before he leaves medina on this military expedition to tabuk is that he asks the mu'minin for financial support because it's a long journey and because they will they will be fighting against a formidable enemy this military campaign required a lot of financial support. So many of the mu'mineen came forward and made financial contributions. Some of the wealthy companions, they made large donations. And, of, and some of the companions who were of modest means they came forward and the ahadith mention a couple of them. Salim ibn Umayr al-Ansari, Abu Aqil al-Ansari. Some of the Ansari Muslims who were very poor, they were destitute. The narrations say that some of them, they were so eager to help the Prophet that they worked overtime. Some of them were farmers. They worked overtime and they were able to collect a handful of dates. That's all they had. They couldn't give anything other than a handful of dates to help satiate the hunger of the soldiers on this long journey. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here makes mention of how the hypocrites are reacting to the two groups who are, who are financially supporting the Prophet. Now, as we mentioned, some of the Sahaba were wealthy. They made large contributions. So the Munafiqeen, what would they do? They would, they would ridicule them. They would, say, they would say, oh, you're just giving to show off. You're not sincere. And when the Munafiqeen, when the hypocrites saw that some of the poor companions of the Prophet were offering very meager things, like a handful of dates, they started to ridicule them, saying that, what is this? What is the, what is the Prophet? What are the Muslims going to do with a handful of dates? They belittled their contribution. Now, what we learn, brothers and sisters, from this ayah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the sincere contribution of someone, even if they have very little to offer. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strongly rebukes the munafiqeen for ridiculing those poor believers for making a humble contribution. This is why, brothers and sisters, in Islam, there is more focus on the quality of your deeds than the quantity. This is why in a famous hadith, Qudsi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa, Ya Musa, ma urida bihi wajhi fa kathirun qalilu. O Musa, the one who gives for my sake, meaning you do it with sincerity, a little of it is a lot. Fa kathirun qalilu. Those handful of dates, to you it's nothing, it's qalil. 
But if it's done with ikhlas, it's considered kathir. It's considered a lot. It has value. وَمَا أُرِيدَ بِهِ غَيْرِي فَقَلِيلٌ كَثِيرٌ And what is given for other than the sake of Allah, what is done for other than Allah, even if it seems to be a lot, it is very little. It has no value. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Mulk, for example, in ayah number two, he mentions the importance of evaluating the quality of our, of our deeds. Ask yourself, why are you doing this specific action? Why are you giving? Is it to achieve nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah says in ayah number two of Surah Al-Mulk, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةِ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ, ليبلوكم أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Allah is the one who created death and life so he may try you and see who is the best in deeds. Ahsanu amala. Allah doesn't say aktharu amala. The emphasis is not on the abundance of your deeds, but rather what? The excellence, the quality of those deeds. And as I, as I was reading this, this ayah, it reminded me, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, he's rebuking the munafiqeen for making fun of those poor believers who only had a handful of dates to offer the Prophet when he asked them to, to donate and to support this military uh, expedition. It reminded me of the story of Shatita. Some of you may have heard the story, others of you may, may not be familiar with it. It is, it is reported that during the time of Imam al-Kadhim our seventh Imam, the Imam السلام, was in Medina at the time. And the Imam, just like all of the other Imams, they, have, they had wakala, they had representatives throughout the Islamic empire. On one occasion, one of the representatives of Imam al-Kadhim in Naysabur. Naysabur is, is in an area close to Mashhad today. He was in Naysabur and he told the Shias that were living in Naysabur that I'm going to be traveling to Medina to see Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al kadhim If there is anyone among you who has a question, you want a fatwa, if any of you wants to convey your salam, if any of you has khums to pay, come and deliver everything to me and I will deliver it to the Imam. Many of the businessmen of Naysabur, they came to the Imam and they gave the Imam السلام, large amounts of money to pay as khums to Imam al kadhim So one businessman comes with gold, with silver. Some people have questions. Some people want this wakil to convey their personal salam to the Imam. So one by one, people surround this wakil to deliver certain huquq, certain rights, religious dues that they want to be delivered to the Imam. So he collects large amounts of, of money. Some people have gifts for the Imam they want to give. And then an old lady, an old lady by the name of Shatita, she comes to the wakil in Naysabur. She says to him that I would love, it's my dream, to go to Medina and visit my Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. But I'm not able to. But I have something that I want you to deliver to him. I have, I live a very simple life and I have two dirhams that are my khums for this year that I want you to deliver to the Imam. So the man, he sees that, it's just two dirhams. He says, okay, I'll take it. You know, all, all of the other businessmen and merchants, they had hundreds and thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of dinars and dirhams to deliver. So he just, he takes the two dirhams and he, he tosses them in his bag. When this wakil of Imam al kadhim when he reaches Medina, he says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I am care, I am bearing the religious dues from the from your Shia of Naysabur. And one by one, 
the wakil gives the imam. He says, this is some gold from this merchant. The imam salam, says, return it to him. Because his money is mixed with haram. He cheats people. And the, 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 the wakil then gives the imam other money, large sums of money. The imam, one by one, he says, send it back. I don't accept it. This person is a liar. He's a cheater. He, he earned his money through unlawful means. One by one, the Imam السلام, he rejects the khums from these people. You know, brothers and sisters, you know, today when we pay khums to our maraja, you know, because they don't know what we do, they accept it. But if it was the Imam السلام, perhaps many of much a lot of the khums that we pay to the Imam, perhaps the Imams won't accept it because our money is not lawful. So one by one, the Imam السلام, says, give it back to this person, give it back to that person. And then Imam al kadhim he asks the wakil, where are the two dirhams of shatita? The man, the wakil, takes it out and he says, here it is. The Imam السلام, he says, take 50 dirhams as a gift to her, convey my salam to her. Her money is halal money. Convey my salam to her and tell her that she will be leaving this life in a few days, in a short while. And when she dies, I will bury her and I will recite the janazah prayer over her. And indeed, the Imam السلام, when she passed away, the Imam السلام, miraculously was able to travel to Naysabur and he buried her and he recited Salatul Mayyit on her. Who's Shatita? Was she a ma was she a Masuma? Was she related to Ahlul Bayt? She was an old woman living in one of the distant villages of Naysabur. She had never seen the Imam alayhi salam. But what made her so special to Imam al kalb She only gave two dirhams. It's a small amount of money. Why was she so beloved to the Imam? Because she had taqwa. Because she was a God-fearing woman. She was devout. She, was, she had ikhlas. If you have ikhlas, if you're sincere, if you have taqwa, you don't need to travel to see the Imam. The Imam will come to you. You know, many people, they ask, you know, why is the Imam in occultation? Why is he in ghaybah? The, the reality is that we are hidden from the Imam. It's not that the Imam is hidden from us. In the same way that Imam al kadhim appeared to Shatita, he made himself accessible to her, the Imam السلام, he will make himself accessible to us if we have taqwa, if we, if we are people of taqwa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he rebukes these munafiqeen for making fun of the believers when they make their small contributions. فَيَسْخَرُونَ مِنْهُمْ They mock them. سَخِرَ اللَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Allah will ridicule them. What does it mean when Allah says He will ridicule them? Does it mean that Allah is going to make jokes about them? No. What is the purpose of ridiculing someone? To humiliate them. When Allah says God will humiliate them, He will ridicule them, it means that He will humiliate them. He will take away their honor. وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ And for them is a painful punishment. In the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ayah number 80, Allah says, Istaghfir lahum, aw la tastaghfir lahum. In tastaghfir lahum sab'eena marratan, falen yaghfir Allahu lahum, thalika bi annahum kafaru billahi wa rasoolih, wallahu la yahdi al-qawm al-fasiqeen. Allah says, seek forgiveness for them, or don't seek forgiveness for them. If you seek forgiveness for them 70 times, God will not forgive them. That is because they disbelieved in God and His Messenger, and God does not guide the corrupt. Look at the mercy of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, how, how soft his heart is. Rasulullah ﷺ, when he sees the munafiqeen, or when he hears that the hypocrites are ridiculing the mu'mineen. 
What does he say? Does he ask Allah, oh Allah, send down your punishment upon them? His first reaction is to do what? He does istighfar for them. He asks Allah to forgive them, to pardon them. The default nature of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, is what? Is to forgive, to give people a way out, to show them mercy, to make excuses for them. Maybe they're ignorant, maybe they don't understand. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet that these people, these munafiqeen, whether you ask for forgiveness, you ask God to forgive them or you don't, even if you ask Allah to forgive them 70 times. Now the word, the number 70 here does not mean literal. It doesn't mean that if Rasulullah does istighfar for them 71 times, Allah will accept it. 70 is, is symbolic. And it denotes abundance, meaning no matter how much you do istighfar for them, they will not be forgiven. Why will they not be forgiven? Because they're not remorseful, because they reject God. They have animosity towards the message, the, the messenger. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept their, to forgive them, there has to be remorse. And this shows you, brothers and sisters, that if you and I, we commit sin and we have no remorse, you know, one of, you know, the, the first step of tawbah is what? And nadam ala ma mada is that you have to be remorseful. You have to feel sorry. You have to change your attitude. You have to acknowledge the wrongdoing. Allah is telling the Prophet that you can do istighfar for them day and night. It's not going to, it's not going to affect, have any effect. Not because your dua is not effective. For your dua to have an effect, they have to have remorse. That you have to be qualified to receive the forgiveness of God. And in order for you to qualify for His forgiveness, it, you have to have remorse. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not guide the corrupt. This shows you, brothers and sisters, that don't think that, you know, I'm just going to sin and I'm not going to have any remorse i'm not going to make toba i'm going to belittle you know my relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and i'll just i'll just depend on the prophet's istighfar rasulullah's istighfar is not going to have an effect if you don't have remorse if you want his shafa'a there are certain things that will qualify you for his shafa'a and that is one of them is that you have to be you have to have some remorse for the sins that you commit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then in ayah number 81, he says, فَرِحَ الْمُخَلَّفُونَ بِمَقْعَدِهِمْ خِلَافَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَكَرِهُوا أَنْ يُجَاهِدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنْفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَقَالُوا لَا تَنْفِرُوا فِي الْحَرِّ قُلْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمَ أَشَدُّ حَرًّا لَوْ كَانُوا يَفْقَهُونَ Allah says, those who were left behind, were happy, they were exalted in staying back, opposing the messenger of God, and were averse to striving with their wealth and their selves in the way of God. And they said, don't go forth in the heat. Say the fire of hell is of a heat more intense if they but understood. The first word in this ayah is what? Fariha, they were happy. You know, these hypocrites who made excuses to stay behind, it's not that they were yearning to join the messenger and they had a valid excuse. They were happy to stay in Medina and let the Prophet and the Muslims march towards Tabuk. They were happy. And this raises an important issue. You know, we live in a time in a, in a culture that teaches us what? Follow your heart. Do what makes you happy, right? We're always being told that. That live your life in a way, do whatever makes you happy. As if making, as if being happy is equivalent to living a moral life. You know, brothers and sisters, sometimes what makes us happy 
is not in accordance with Allah's pleasure. It's not in accordance with Allah's pleasure. And that is an indication of a person with an immature soul. You know, there are things that might make you happy, but that doesn't mean that that's something that you should pursue. That you shouldn't just follow your heart and say, I'm going to do whatever makes me happy. Because if your soul is still at the level of nafsul ammara, there are certain things that might make you happy, but you are, you're transgressing. You're defying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there are some people who are spiritually elevated. And their happiness is what? They find happiness in worship. They find happiness in doing things that are pleasing to Allah. You know, you take, for example, the companions of Imam al Hussein. If you look at the Ashab of Imam al Hussein, I swear to you, brothers and sisters, all of them, without exception, they were happy to be in Karbala with Imam al Hussein. They were happy. So you compare their this type of happiness to the happiness of Munafiqeen who stayed behind and they Abandon the Prophet. They, they don't support the Prophet. On the day of Ashura, John, this slave, this African slave, who was maybe over 90 years old, 90 years old on the day of Ashura, he was, when he fell on the plains of Karbala and he was bleeding and he was in his last moments. Imagine receiving, you know, wounds from spears and, and swords and knives. He's bleeding to death. Imam al Hussein rushes to him. And the Imam السلام, does something to John that he only does with his own son, Ali al Akbar. He puts his cheek on the cheek of John. And then some of the narrations say that John begins to cry. Why is he crying? He cries tears of joy. He's happy. You may say he's, he's dying, he's bleeding to death. No, he's happy, he's crying. Because this is a man who whose joy is always connected to obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to ask yourself, brothers and sisters, that is my happiness and my sadness, is it connected to the pleasure and the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And this is why, you know, in the, the, the ayyam, the days of Fatimiyah, you know, we, we mentioned the hadith in Allah Yarva li Riva Fatima wa Yaghab li Ghadabiha. That it's it's one thing for a believer to be happy when Allah is pleased, to be happy when God is obeyed. But it's an entirely it's an it's an entirely higher level, not another level of spirituality when you yourself become the, the reflection of divine wrath and divine pleasure. And that is what we see in Lady Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. So these munafiqeen, they were happy to stay behind. They refused. They disliked. They disliked. They were averse to striving with their wealth and their selves. You know, some of the munafiqeen, some of the hypocrites, they outright refuse to support the Prophet. Others are more clever. They say, no, no, no. We want to support you, Ya Rasulullah, but right now it's too hot. We might get a heat stroke, right? They say, we'll, we'll, we'll support you, but not now, later on. What's the excuse that they give? So number one, they stay behind. They don't want to join. And what do they do? They discourage others from joining. They say, no, no, don't go, don't go. لا تنفروا في الحر. Don't go in the sweltering heat. You know, and, th and this is subhanAllah. If you read Nahjul Balagha, this is exactly what some of the soldiers of Imam Ali السلام, were complaining about when the Imam would try to mobilize them to fight Muawiyah. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he complains in Nahjul Balagh. He says, 
In the summertime, when I tell you to join me, you say it's too hot. And in the winter time, when I tell you to join me, you say it's too cold. And then the Imam, he tells them that, you know, you you resemble men, but you're not really men. Ya ashbah rijal wala rijal. That many people, they look like men. He has a beard. He's he's a, He looks like a man, but in reality, he's not a man. He's a coward. Amir al-Mu'mineen. He, he, he dealt with similar people complaining about the weather Allah tells the Prophet that these munafiqeen and you see how the Prophet is told to have a more stern strict tone with the hypocrites Allah says to the Prophet that these munafiqeen who start complaining that no 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 it's too hot to go and fight قُلْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمَ أَشَدُّ حَرَّ tell them Ya Rasulullah that if they think this is hot, Jahannam is hotter. They want to stay back. They want to make excuses. You see the Prophet Allah is training the Prophet how to deal with munafiqeen. That be gentle, be lenient with mu'mineen. But these munafiqeen, put them in a corner. Allow them to expose themselves. Do not be lenient with them. Be very firm with them. Tell them that it's too hot. Okay, if you can't handle this heat, Good luck in Jahannam. Very firm. They would realize this if they if they had tafaqqur, if they had a deep understanding of these realities. They think that they're going to find comfort in staying back, staying behind. But the reality of abandoning the messenger is self-destruction. You're bringing destruction to your soul when you do not respond to the call of the messenger. This is the reality of your action. Your action itself is adab, is punishment. You're inflicting punishment on your own soul, but you don't, you don't realize it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 82, what does he say? فَلْيَضْحَكُوا قَلِيلًا وَلْيَبْكُوا كَثِيرًا جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ Allah says, so let them laugh little and weep much as a recompense for what they used to do. The munafiqeen, many of them, the hypocrites, oftentimes, especially when they're in private gatherings with one another, they would ridicule, they would mock the Prophet. As we mentioned in the previous verses, they would mock the Prophet, they would ridicule him, they would make fun of the other believers, and they would laugh amongst each other as though you know their, their plans and their plots are working, as though they're fooling Rasulullah and they're fooling the, the believers. Allah says, let them laugh little and weep much as a recompense for the, what they used to do. You know, very soon, their laughing is going to be very little. They're going to weep a lot. You know, there's a hadith from the Holy Prophet He says, لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ مَا أَعْلَمْ لَضَحِكْتُمْ قَلِيلًا وَلَبَكَيْتُمْ كَثِيرًا The Prophet he says, If you knew what I know, you would laugh very little and you would weep very much. Brothers and sisters, wallahi, we're totally ignorant. We're ignorant of, of this life, let alone what's going to happen in the hereafter, what awaits us. You know, one of the one of the uh, the scholars, you know, a Shafi'i, he's the head of the Shafi'i school of thought. He has an interesting statement about the the squeezing in the grave. He says that one squeeze in the grave will make you forget about all the hugs you received in dunya. And it's true. One squeeze in the grave will make you forget about all of the hugs you received in dunya. Brothers and sisters, if this veil was lifted and we would see the angels and we would see the reality of what awaits us in the hereafter, many of us wouldn't be laughing too much. If we saw the reality of what we're doing, the reality of 
what's happening to our what's happening to our souls when we backbite when we lie what happens to us when we miss salatul fajr when we delay our prayers if we knew the reality of things we wouldn't be laughing so much we would be crying we would be weeping in fact even if you look at the the books of fiqh it's makru to to laugh in a way to laugh out loud you know how some people when they laugh they make a sound it's called tahtaha. they laugh out loud these boisterous laughing laughing out loud this is actually makru for someone to laugh out loud it's something that's not haram it's disliked the prophet his laugh was a smile and when something was very funny you were you could see his molars meaning he would smile that was the extent the full extent of his laugh the prophet wouldn't laugh out loud and laugh in an obnoxious way if someone laughs out loud this is makru and in fact there's a kafara for it there's a recommended kafara for someone who laughs out loud what is it you make dua allahumma la tamqutni oh allah do not send your wrath down upon me imagine how discouraged it is for someone to just laugh out loud and be obnoxious that a believer should have discipline should be very regal and dignified in the way that they carry themselves so this is the kafara of laughing out loud allahumma la tamqutni so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says laugh very laugh very little and and, and uh, weep very much as a recompense for what you used to do. Ayah number 83. إِنَّكُمْ رَضِيتُمْ بِالْقُعُودِ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةٍ فَقْعُدُوا مَعَ الْخَالِفِينَ And if God returns you to a group of them, and they seek permission of you to go forth, say you shall not go forth with me, ever, nor shall you fight with me against any enemy. You were content to stay back the first time, so stay back with those who remain behind. Allah in this ayah, what is he saying? That, O oh Muhammad, many of them, they said to you, many of these munafiqeen, they say, Ya Rasulullah, we weren't able to make it with you this time. But if when you come back, the next time we'll join you. Allah says that if, if God returns you, if you come back to them, and they ask you for permission, you know, let's assume that these munafiqeen, they come and they ask you for permission. They don't want to join you, but they pretend that they want to join you. The next time, Allah says to the Prophet, the next time they come and they ask you permission to fight, tell them that you shall not go forth with me ever. فَقُلْ لَنْ تَخْرُجُوا مَعْيَ أَبَدًا I don't want your support. You're not going to do it. They don't want to do it. It's all talk. But don't even make it sound like you need them. You don't need them, Ya Rasulullah. Why does the Prophet do this? The Prophet tells them that you're not ever going to join me, nor will you ever fight against the enemies. You were pleased. You were content to stay behind the first time, and therefore, you're going to remain behind. You see the Prophet ﷺ is doing what? He's exposing the munafiqeen. Those who refused to join him and they were pleased and they were happy to stay behind, Allah tells the Prophet that the next time they ask you for permission, they, they act as though they're ready to support you, you turn them down. You tell them, no, you stay behind. Why does Allah do this? Why is the messenger instructed to speak with the munafiqeen in such a way? To remind them that Islam doesn't need you. Some people, they act as though, if I don't contribute, Islam, 
is going to disintegrate. Islam is going to fall apart. Allah in this verse, He reminds them, He reminds the munafiqeen, and He also reminds us that don't think for a moment that Islam needs you. No. The religion of Allah doesn't need you. Islam doesn't need you. You need Islam. You're not in a position to negotiate. You know, sometimes, you know, a very simple example. You know, sometimes you go to a small shop. It's a very small business. And you walk in, you are in a position to negotiate. You know, especially these small stores. If you don't like the price, you can negotiate. Bring it down 10, 15, 20%, 50% off. You can negotiate. Why can you negotiate? Why is it that you're able to negotiate? Because they need you. They want your they need your business. That's why these small businesses, these small shops, they're willing to negotiate with you. Because they need you. They need your business. But next time you go to Target or Walmart, when you go to the checkout line, try to negotiate the price for your groceries. Are they going to negotiate with you? No. It's fixed. Take it or leave it. Why do they have that attitude? Why do these big corporations have that type of attitude? Because they don't need you. You're replaceable. There are millions and millions of other customers. You need them. They have something that you need. Islam is greater than all of these corporations, all of these businesses. This is the religion of God. The control, the master of the heavens and the earth, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He doesn't need you. You need him. Therefore, when you are afforded an opportunity to serve, to be a participant, you take it. You don't make excuses. You should be honored to be a participant. And this is the message that is being sent to the munafiqeen. That you, since you belittled this gift, and you refuse to support the prophet and you have animosity towards this religious movement we don't need you don't think for a moment because in the previous verses the language was what why don't you support the prophet why don't you join why don't you fight why are you staying behind now that's it you don't want to support rasulullah rasulullah doesn't need you allah will make him prevail even without your help and then Allah in ayah number 84, what does he say? وَلَا تُصَلِّ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَا تَأَبَدًا وَلَا تَقُمْ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِهِ إِنَّهُمْ كَفَرُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَمَاتُوا وَهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ And never pray over one of them who dies, nor stand by his grave. Truly they disbelieved in God and his messenger and died iniquitous. They died in a state of corruption. Now, brothers and sisters, Muslims have certain rights. In our Sharia, in the Islamic Sharia, when a Muslim dies, even if he is a sinner, he's fasiq, even if he didn't offer one single prayer in his life, anyone who says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, when you join the fold of Islam, you automatically have certain rights. Among those rights is what? You have the right to be buried. You have the right to an Islamic funeral. But there are certain things that are privileges. And one of the privileges is that the Prophet prays over you. You see, brothers and sisters, when a Muslim would die during the time of the Prophet, Rasulullah would do Salatul Mayyit. And he used to do the, the prayer over the deceased for all Muslims. This is what he used to do. No matter who died, the Prophet ﷺ, he would conduct the funeral prayers and he would do Salatul Mayyit. Salatul Mayyit, it's not like the Salah that we offer, like the daily prayers. There's no Ruku', there's no Sujood. It's five takbirat, five takbirat. This is how the Prophet used to do Salatul Mayyit. This is how we do Salatul Mayyit. 
Here Allah is telling the Prophet, do not pray over these munafiqeen when they die. So you see there are certain things that Allah is telling the Prophet. Don't allow them to join you in battle. Leave them behind. Even if they ask you permission, they stay. They're not participating. When they die, expose them. How do you expose them? By not praying over them. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, we know that he used to pray over munafiqeen, but how did he pray over them? There's a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi where he says, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَيْهِ إِذَا صَلَّى عَلَى الْمَيِّتِ كَبَّرَ فَتَشَهَدْ When the Prophet would pray over a deceased person, when he would do Salatul al-Mayyit, he would recite takbir. First takbir, after the first takbir, he would do the tashahud. أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَا وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُ then the Prophet would do a second takbir. Imam, Imam al-Sadiq is explaining Salatul Mayyid. The Prophet, the second time, he do, would do takbir. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. He would do a third takbir. After the third takbir, Allahumma ghafir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat. He would do a fourth takbir. After the fourth takbir, he would make a dua for the deceased. Allahumma ghfir li hadha al-mayyit. And then he would do the fifth takbir. فَلَمَّا نَهَى اللَّهُ عَنَ الصَّلَاةِ عَلَى الْمُنَافِقِينَ When this ayah was revealed, where Allah tells the Prophet, do not pray over them, do not pray over the munafiqeen, what does he do? كَبَّرَ وَتَشَهَّدْ ثُمَّ كَبَّرَ وَصَلَّى عَلَى النَّبِي وَدَعَى ثُمَّ كَبَّرَ وَدَعَى لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ ثُمَّ كَبَّرَ وَانْصَرَفْ وَلَمْ يَدْعُ لِلْمَيِّتِ If a munafiq died, he would do four takbiras and he would not make dua for the mayyit. But if it was a mu'min, he would make dua for the deceased. And then Allah says what? Allah says, وَلَا تُصَلِّ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَا تَأَبَدًا وَلَا تَقُمْ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِهِ Do not visit his grave. Imagine. You know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he used to visit the graves of the shuhada. Now Allah says, do not visit the graves of munafiqeen. Because you're a mercy, ya Rasulullah. Your presence... Your mere presence will take away Adab al Qabr from, for them. Don't leave them. Don't even go near their graves. Because a munafiq, you know, in dunya, we treat them like, like Muslims. But when they die, we treat them as they are. They're munafiqeen. Their reality is kufr. So they are deprived of these privileges that are afforded to mu'mineen. إِنَّهُمْ كَفَرُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Truly they disbelieved in God and His Messenger. وَمَاتُوا وَهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ and they, and they died in a state of fisk. They were corrupt. They transgressed the boundaries. So this is dua al-mayyit. So this is salatu al-mayyit. Towards the end of the Prophet's life, the the believers, the Muslims would know, they would watch when the Prophet would do Salatul Mayyit. If he did four takbiras, they know, oh man, this guy was a munafiq. We didn't realize it. He he was exposed at the time of his death. And in, in many cases, those who the Prophet did not, he told them to stay behind, they were also exposed. But especially at the time of death, munafiqeen were exposed. If the Prophet does five takbiras, it is known that this person is a mu'min. In ayah number 85, and we'll conclude here, Allah seems to be answering a question that may cross the mind of the believers. And that is that, you know, many of these munafiqeen, they're wealthy, they're powerful. 
They have they come from huge tribes. They have a lot of children. It seems that Allah has blessed them. You know, if they're if they're so bad, why has Allah given them so much? You know, sometimes you know people think to themselves that look at all of these atheists, these criminals. They live such comfortable lives. They're healthy. They have so much wealth. They have so much influence. You know, the world is their oyster, as they say. They have everything. If they're so evil, why has Allah given them so much? Allah answers here. وَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَأَوْلَادُهُمْ إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُعَذِّبَهُمْ بِهَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَتَزْهَقَ أَنفُسُهُمْ وَهُمْ كَافِرُونَ And let not their wealth and their children impress you. God only intends to punish them in this world and that their souls depart at death while they are disbelievers. It's interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, He says, don't be impressed by what I have given them in the form of wealth and children. This doesn't mean that I have favored them. If this means that I have favored them, I gave I gave the dunya to Fir'aun, I gave the dunya to Namrud. If this dunya, if this life had any value, I would have given it to Adam, I would have given it to Ibrahim, I would have given it to Isa, I would, I would have given it on a silver platter to Fatima to Zahra. What value does this life have? There's a, there's a hadith from the Ahlul Bayt, they say, Min hawan dunya ala Allah. They say one of the signs that this life really doesn't have very much value in the eyes of Allah is that the head of Yahya, the head of a prophet, was given to a prostitute from among the prostitutes of Bani Israel as a mahar, as a gift. What kind of what kind of light what kind of world is this? What kind of value does a life like this have that such atrocities are committed? This life doesn't have value. So Allah says, don't be impressed by what I have given to them. That's that's not an indication of divine favor. If it was a sign of divine favor, I would have given it to my awliya. And interestingly, Allah says, What? Allah doesn't only say, Don't be impressed. In fact, the thing that you, what you think is a blessing is actually a punishment for them. You know, sometimes we think that the the kuffar, the munafiqeen, these wicked people, they're enjoying themselves in dunya and in the akhirah Allah is going to punish them. Allah says, "No. Innama yuridu Allahu an yu'adhibahum biha fi dunya Allah wants to punish them through their wealth, through their children in this life. How does Allah punish them? Have you seen, you know, I've, I've met many wealthy people. You know, yeah, on Instagram they look happy. But if you meet them in person, they're miserable. Always stressed, always worried. Their children are distracting them. Their families are falling apart. They're not happy. You think that you would think that they're happy, they have everything, but no. Allah says, I gave them all of these things as a punishment to keep them distracted from my remembrance. And the greatest agony for the human soul is to be disconnected from Allah. This is the real punishment, as we mentioned. That the, the things that you think are a source of enjoyment, Allah says, No, those things that everyone is envious of. It's actually the source of their misery. I make it the source of their misery. Subhanallah, if you look at Fir'aun, what made Fir'aun so wealthy? What made him so wealthy? What made him so wealthy was really the Nile River. Because the Nile River is the reason why that area was so fertile. There was so much produce, there was so much khayr in Egypt because of the Nile River. What does Allah use to destroy Fir'aun? He drowns him in the Nile, in the, in, the, uh, in the Red Sea. So 
Allah uses the thing that gives him strength as the punishment. He brings him down with it. So Allah says that the things that you perceive as the source of their enjoyment is actually the source of their misery. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين. Any questions or comments? Assalamualaikum Sheikh. Was a Nisa Bur a place where Shias could live freely without oppression? It sounds like the land of Canada was totally free to uh, openly be a Shia over there. I don't know if we can say that. It was uh, a place where where Shias were safe necessarily. I mean, especially during the time of Imam al-Kadhim, you're, you're talking about the the rule of Bani Abbas, and Bani Abbas in in many cases were were actually even more brutal towards the followers of Ahlul Bayt than even the Umayyads. But Nisabur, what we know from especially during that time, it was considered a center of learning. For the uh, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, there were many ulama that uh, that lived in these regions. The imams had many companions, many learned companions who lived in uh, in Naysabu. But it could be that again, a lot of these wakala they were very discreet. So it could be that they sent message a message through their own networks that this wakil is going to Baghdad, and they would you know uh, they would meet and kind of deposit uh, the money or or the goods that they wanted to, to have delivered to uh, to Medina, but I wouldn't go as far as to say that yes, it was entirely safe uh, for the Shia. The Shias were always being persecuted, but perhaps relative to other areas, it was probably a safer area than others, but not necessarily a safe region for Shias. Uh, thank you. And uh, someone was asking, um, what can a person do to connect further with Allah? At times we drift away and the heart can't reattach. What can someone do to keep connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, the, the best way is dhikr. You know, the best way to stay connected, you, you can't be connected to someone unless you remember them. You know, if you have a friend, how do you stay connected to a friend? You keep in touch with them, even if it's very minimal. You know, if you have a friend that, you know, that is distant and you want to connect with them, you might send them a message, a phone call every once in a while. The most important thing is that you keep that connection open. And as I, as I mentioned in our previous sessions, you will inevitably experience these fluctuations. But let, let me share with you something very simple that you can do that has a lot of thawab and it's something very simple. You know, because we live in times that are very busy. You know, most people can't do nawafil. They ba barely can recite duas. So they, they want to hold on to something that that makes them feel connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and, and is, is very rewarding. There's a, uh, there's a uh, hadith where it is mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ, one day he came to visit Fatima to Zahra السلام, his daughter. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says to her that, Oh my daughter Fatima, do not go to bed at night unless you have performed Hajj and Umrah, unless you have recited the entire Quran, unless you have pleased all of the believers and unless you have secured the shafa'a of all prophets. So Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, she says, before I could ask him, how, I, how can I do these things? He started to pray. So she says, I waited for my father to finish his salah. After he finished, I asked him, Ya Rasulullah, how can I perform Hajj and Umrah every night before I sleep? And how can I recite the entire Quran 
every night before I go to sleep? And how can I please all of the believers before I go to sleep? And how can I secure the shafa'ah of all of the prophets? So it seems like a very long order. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi tells her, before you sleep, say, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. At-tasbihatul arba, right? The, the tasbih that we recite in our prayers, one time. If you recite this one time before you go to sleep, Allah will give you the reward of one hajj and one umrah. Now, this doesn't mean that you don't go to hajj. A recommended hajj and umrah. Number two, the Prophet says, she says, how can I recite the entire Qur'an before I sleep? Rasulullah says, recite Surah Al-Ikhlas three times. The one who recites it three times, it's equivalent to reciting the, the entire Qur'an. So do that before you sleep. Number three, how do I please all of the mu'mini? You know, if you think about that, it's how do you please all of them? You know, it's, it's difficult to make people happy. How do you please all of the believers before you go to sleep? Do you, you pick up the phone and you call them and you send them gifts? No. Rasulullah says, before you sleep every night, say, Allahumma ghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat. Oh Allah, forgive all of the believing men and women. If you ask, if you make a dua for someone, isn't that going to make them happy? So by doing this, short dua before you sleep, you have earned the pleasure of all of the believers. And then number four, finally, and you see these are very short. Believe me, this will take you maybe less than a minute or two to do before you sleep. In bed, you lie down and you recite these things. Instead of you know watching YouTube and watching Netflix before you sleep, you know, do spend a minute and a half and invest in your spirituality. Number four, she says, Oh my father, how can I gain the shafa'ah? How does someone gain the shafa'ah of all of the prophets? All of them, from Adam until Rasulullah. He says to her, Say before you sleep, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad wa ala jami' al anbiya wal mursaleen. Oh Allah, send salutations upon Muhammad and his progeny and upon all of the prophets and the messengers. So this, do this, do this only for 40 days. Every night, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar, you earn hajj and umrah. Recite surah qul huwa allah wahad three times. Allahumma ghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat. Allahumma salli ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad wa ala jami' al anbiya wal mursaleen. Is that difficult? This is maybe, maybe two minutes, even less than that. So this is something that is very rewarding, very simple, and it's something that, you know, that you can make a habit of it. You know, to, to do something small on a regular basis, to be consistent with a small good deed, is better than doing a grand good deed every once in a while. Inshallah, I hope that's useful. Uh, thank you, Sheikh. Uh, reciting all this with intention, sound, uh, that's a uh, challenge in and of itself as well. It is, inshallah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kareem. He's generous. You know, as the, as the narrations say that if you take one step towards Allah, Allah will take 10 steps towards you. So, you know, Allah, you know, consider this your one step towards Allah and Allah will open up doors of goodness for, for you, inshallah. Inshallah. Um, the prohibitions that were mentioned for the monophics, were they uh, prohibitions specifically intended for the prophet, like not praying or visiting their graves? It seems like a normal person trying to implement this would uh, be ready, wading into a risky territory. I mean, without a doubt, the command is for the prophet, and we can also reasonably extend it to the, uh, the imams of Ahlul Bayt. But with us, we can't, we don't know what's in someone's heart. Only Rasulullah knows the status of someone's heart when they die. So even me and you, even if someone was a munafiq, and we knew that this person was, he wasn't even really Muslim. And, but the community considered him Muslim, and 
you know, if, if someone says La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, we judge by the vahir. So it's, it, we're not allowed to say, okay, this person is munafiq and therefore I'm going to do uh, four, uh, four takbirat. However, we do have in our fiqh that, that the five takbirat, because in the Sunni tradition, they only do four. They only do four. We, we do five takbirat. So they do four takbirat for whatever reason. Maybe according to their fiqh, that's what it is. But uh, for someone who's ithna uh, ashari, we, we do salatul mayyid, five takbirat. If someone is from a different madhab, we don't do five takbirat. This is for the followers of Ahlul Bayt. So the four takbirat for salatul mayyid, that's according to their fiqh. So, you know... They're buried in that their their funeral prayer is is according to their own uh, school of jurisprudence. But in the madhab of Ahlul Bayt, our fiqh asserts that it's it's five uh, takbiras. And uh, are there can you share any stories of uh, how people reacted when they would notice the Prophet uh, exposing these people after they passed away? So. One of the one of the famous or the notorious munafiqeen during the uh, the time of uh, the Prophet was uh, was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. He was one of the famous munafiqeen, and there are conflicting narrations. Some narrations say that the Prophet the the prohibition came after the Prophet did Salatul Mayyit on him. Other narrations say that no, it came before and when. When Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, when he died, Rasulullah only did four takbiras. Others say that he didn't even attend his funeral prayer. The Prophet simply sent, he basically sent his abaya, his garment, and told his tribe that wrap him in this. And when the Prophet was asked, that, why are you doing this? He says, no. He's like, my garment is not going to protect him from punishment, but rather this kind gesture might bring his tribe to Islam. And indeed, this, according to some narrations, that's what happened, that the Prophet didn't recite the funeral prayer of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Rather, he sent his cloak, a garment, and the, the, his tribe, was so, they were so honored that they became, uh, many of them became Muslim. But the Prophet did not uh, recite his funeral prayer because, of, uh, because he, was, uh, he was a munafiq. Now, I don't know how many times this happened during the time of the prophets. You know, someone might have to do research on this. But I could imagine that, you know, this, this would be very humiliating for, uh, for the tribe, the family. And, uh, yeah, so that, that's why, you know, a lot of the, when people, that's why when people died, especially towards the end, after this verse was revealed, people would keep a close, uh, close eye on how the prophet would conduct the funeral prayers, but the Prophet only lived for about two years. And unfortunately, the, the main munafiqeen continued to live. So so the, 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 indica the indicator that was used after the Prophet, just like many of the ashab, they would say that we knew the we could distinguish the mu'min from the munafiq after the death of the Prophet by how by their relationship with Ali ibn Abi Talib. They had contempt for Ali. They had malice towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. We know this is a munafiq. And if they were, they had love and they were followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib, we know that these are people of Iman. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Shaykh, you mentioned about uh, Prophet Zakaria's head. Uh, whenever we read in history about uh, Imam Hussein and his salam, and uh, whenever Imam is mentioned, there is a mention of Prophet Zakaria and his salam. So, uh, what is the relationship between them? Uh, you know, can you please throw some light on it? You mean Prophet Yahya? Yahya, son of Zakaria, you mean? Yeah. So, there's an interesting uh, story 
about uh, about Zakaria, his father. You know, brothers and sisters, according to many ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt, the tragedy of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was revealed to all the prophets. All of the prophets, without exception, they were informed of what was to happen to the grandson of the final messenger of God. And they were given certain details about what would transpire. We have a hadith that mentioned Adam. Adam wept for Imam al Hussein, Musa, Isa, all of them did. Zakaria alayhi salam was also the same. When he was informed, when it was disclosed to him what would happen to the grandson of the final prophet, Zakaria alayhi salam, he went into his mihrab. Some narrations say for three days he wept. He, he, he secluded himself for three, for three days. And he says, Ilahi, is this going to happen to the son of your beloved? That this is really going to happen? And he, he makes a dua. He says, Ilahi, oh my Lord, if this is what you're going to do to the son, to the grandson of the final prophet, if this is what's going to happen to Hussein, I want my son to die in the same way. And subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered his dua. And you see that the fate of Yahya was similar to the fate of Imam Hussein in, in the fact that they were both, their heads were separated from their bodies. And, uh, and therefore you see that there's a very close relationship, you know, between uh, Yahya alayhi salam and... Uh, and Imam al Hussein, even Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam, he says that when we traveled from Medina to Mecca, Mecca to Karbala, whenever we stopped at any resting station, my father, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, would speak, he would make mention of the martyrdom of Yahya ibn Zakaria. The Imam is foreshadowing what would happen, uh, happen to him. All right, thank you very much, Sheikh. Thank you so much. Jazakumullah khair al Thank you very much, Sheikh. Take very good care of yourself. The community you. needs you, especially the youth. May and Allah protect you for little Zainab and Laya and your entire family and the entire community. May you be under the protection and banner of Imam Sahib Zaman. Allah ta'ala farajah al-Sharif. Be in Allah's care and protection. Thank you so much. May Allah bless you. Allah shout his blessings and his bounties on you and all the other sincere quality ulamas, inshallah. Inshallah, no, inshallah I'm, I'm a student of the ulama. May Allah bless you all, inshallah.